They're the unsung heroes that get you where you're going, but do you really know how pedals work? Let's dig into it. On the most basic level, these are just levers which convert the motion of your leg into usable energy. There's a fulcrum, a load, and a force. And the distance from the fulcrum to the force divided by the fulcrum to the load is the pedal ratio, which will be important to bear in mind. We're gonna look at three main types of pedals today, starting with the one we all enjoy the most. Nowadays, we use what's called drive-by-wire throttle, which just means that the pedal is electronically linked to the throttle body by the car's computer. This means there is no fixed pedal ratio, and manufacturers can create throttle curves. So when you ask for 50% power, you really get 20% or 70%. This is to either improve fuel economy or make your car feel sportier than it really is, but among a few other tuning advantages, it also allows for more advanced traction control, as the throttle blade can shut even if we're idiotically going full beams. Some factory calibrations can be a bit unresponsive, which despite conflicting opinions, is why products like Pedal Commander exist. But on the whole, drive-by-wire is very advanced compared to the old way of doing things. Drive-by-cable. In this setup, the pedal is physically attached to the throttle by means of a linkage. And every time you ask for power, you get it. The pedal ratio is quite important in this design then. And although a cam lobe can still be used to alter the linearity of response, it's not adjustable on the fly. So in terms of calculating the correct ratio to use, we just need to account for the distance the throttle needs to open versus how much we want to move our foot. Keeping things easy, we've gone with two and a half inches on both ends, but you'll notice that's not a one-to-one -one pedal. Yeah. As always, we've run out of room on this car, so things have got a bit complicated to say the least. But more on that in the next build episode. For now, why did we choose this option? Cost. The computer, pedal, and throttle itself are all considerably cheaper in a drive-by cable setup. And while it may be old school, it is still kind of fun. Clutch systems can be hydraulic, electronic, or mechanically actuated, but in all cases they transfer power in their normal state. So the purpose of the pedal is to release the friction disc. This thing. In our case then, the pedal pushes on the master cylinder, forcing fluid down a line to this hydraulic throwout bearing, causing it to extend. That in turn presses on these fingers, which releases the clutch pressure plate from the friction disc and allows them to spin separately. Congratulations, you've now disengaged your clutch. Small wonder the pedal's always depressed then. We take it for granted. Getting the clutch to fully release requires effort and a specific amount of motion though. So to be sure we build a pedal that works, we must do some calculations. According to Centerforce, our pressure plate requires 450 pounds of effort and 3 eighths of an inch of travel on the fingers to fully release. Our release bearing is stated as requiring a 3 quarter inch master cylinder to be actuated 1.1 inches for the bearing to travel half an inch. Okay, when considered as a ratio then, that's 2.2 to 1. So 3 eighths or 0.375 multiplied by 2.2 is 0.825, or a little under 7 eighths of an inch of master cylinder travel to disengage our clutch. Perfect. With some simple cardboard aided design then, we can sketch out the length of the pedal we're wanting, and the lever at the top just needs to move 7 eighths of an inch for whatever travel we desire at our foot. In this case, that's about 5 inches, which translates to a 6.29 to 1 ratio. Awesome! But if it takes 100 pounds of leg force to work, it's no bueno. So to find out, let's take the pedal ratio and multiply that by the advantage at the release bearing to get 13.83 to 1. Dividing the load from the clutch by this number then gives us 32.54 pounds, which is how much leg force it should take to release the clutch. That's perfect. I mean, even if it's closer to 40 pounds due to rounding in our math. Still, perfect. And if you learned anything so far, it'd be great if you pressed subscribe. Oh boy. This is by far the most complicated system, but also the most interesting, so stay with me. At the core, brakes inhibit motion by absorbing energy. And since the late 1920s, nearly all passenger cars have used hydraulic brakes in two flavors, discs and drums. 
Now, drum brakes are still used by some manufacturers today, but the disc is what we'll focus on. In this setup, the master cylinder pushes fluid out to four calipers, which each have one or more pistons that extend and force pads up against the discs, also called rotors. This creates a lot of friction and will turn the kinetic energy of the car into heat, which eventually will slow you down to a stop. It's a very simplified look at the system, but if I was to mention one other component, it would be the booster, which sandwiches in between the pedal and the master cylinder and makes braking easier. We'll come back to that in a bit though. Now, pads are available in various sizes and types of friction material, and discs can be small or large, vented or unvented, cast iron or carbon ceramic. But in all situations, the harder you press on the pedal, the harder the pads get clamped against the disc, and hopefully, the harder you stop. As you can imagine, some of the math needed to set all this up can also be a bit hard, though. So let's start with the simplest formula. The amount of effort applied to the pedal multiplied by the pedal ratio and then divided by the area of the master cylinder gives us the line pressure at the calipers, which should be able to reach 1000 psi as a general rule. As for all these variables though, yeah, this website's gonna be your friend. It may seem daunting, but all we've got to do here is fill in the information on the left. And as it's vehicle specific, it may involve some measuring, researching, or even just using the default values, but it's straightforward enough. We've had to take some best educated guesses, plus ignore downforce altogether, and finally use a slightly higher coefficient of friction for the tires to account for our 200 Treadwear Falcons. These last three items are what we don't know. Yet, here they are in the input field. The booster assist ratio depends on having a pedal ratio, and that also goes for the force required. So great, time to start messing around. The internet says a five to one pedal ratio should be about right for a power assisted car like ours. And although nothing in this project is that simple, nevertheless, like the clutch, we really only want five inches of total leg travel. And in order to keep at least one inch of movement at the master, so it will displace enough fluid, it looks like five to one's a good starting point. Now, thankfully, even though we're still missing two boxes, we can still hit calculate now to get some helpful info. And just like that, almost everything here is now populated and locked in based on the rest of our data, with the two remaining items left to solve being the front and rear master sizes. We'll concentrate on the front one for now, but keep in mind, we already bought this one inch bore master a while ago based on some preliminary math. And it would be great to make it work. Ignoring the booster assist ratio for the moment by just leaving it as one, we can input a pedal force to see what's necessary to equal that one inch bore size. That's not gonna cut it. No matter though, a common suggestion for maximum effort is 100 pounds. So let's try that instead. Okay, fine! Let's toss the bathroom scale on the footwell and see what we can muster. All right, could have done 400, but I didn't want to break the scale. Anyway, how about now? That's more like it. If you're wondering what the heck this even means, technically, if we leave out the booster or it has a failure, we can still achieve the maximum deceleration possible for our car by exerting 148 pounds of leg force which we just did. So that's great to know for emergencies. However, even in lighter applications, there's still no way we're gonna leg press the car to a stop at every traffic light. Yes, switching to a more aggressive ratio and a smaller master would improve things, but that's not where we're headed. We've got a healthy dose of power in this thing, and to make sure it's usable, I need all the driver controls to be equally balanced. So with power steering and a touchy throttle, power brakes are just a necessity. The booster is the final piece of the puzzle then. And without going into this too far, we're using vacuum assist like most OEMs have for decades, mostly because it's cheap and reliable. In this setup then, the engine's intake manifold is directly linked to the booster, applying vacuum to both sides of an internal diaphragm and canceling out any effect. When you step on the pedal though, a clever series of valves and springs opens an orifice to the atmosphere, which breaks this equilibrium. 
The vacuum then starts to build on only one side of the diaphragm, and this pushes on the master cylinder, easing our leg effort. Referring to this chart, our 8-inch dual diaphragm unit is apparently capable of producing 896 psi of line pressure on its own, which, remember, is the pressure of the brake fluid at the calipers. Not too shabby then, especially considering we only need 1,017 psi to reach threshold braking, that being the maximum deceleration possible without locking up the tires. It may seem like we're a bit overkill then, but keep in mind that a booster isn't really an on-off switch, as modulating the pedal will prevent it from just plain locking up the tires, and together with the master cylinder, worst case, we could just swap it for a smaller unit. Regardless, we chose this particular unit, as by making room for it, we can move to a smaller one later. The opposite wouldn't have been possible. So to finish this off and find the booster assist ratio, let's divide the line PSI at a set amount of foot pressure with the booster by the same thing without. Therefore, say 65 pounds of leg force multiplied by the pedal ratio and divided by the master's area gives us 414 PSI of manual line pressure. Plus the booster then, is 1310, which divided by 414 gives us 3.16. Follow that with a colon and a 1, and that's the booster assist ratio. Assuming that chart was accurate, as we have no way of verifying it. But if we plunk that in here along with the 65 pounds, we're still off. Lowering the force to 50 pounds, though, puts us right on the money. These last few calculations change wildly with different inputs, but the point is, we should be close. And if we're not, we can change it later. Ah, yes, the rear master size should be different, but while we could get a stepped tandem cylinder, our current setup will be overbraking the rear. So a good proportioning valve should let us adjust the pressure down and prevent the tires from locking up. That was a lot to digest, but if you made it through, good on you. As a heads up, there is a lot more information in those help buttons, so take your time and do this right. Brakes are worth the effort. We haven't even mentioned ABS or torque vectoring, as neither of those are likely to end up in this car, but who knows? Maybe we'll cover that and more in a future episode. A huge thanks to all the patrons and supporters of this channel who make this possible, and if you've got any questions, please leave them below.